Well, obviously, I planned that. So um, we're supposed to start seven minutes after, but everybody seems quiet, so we start actually a bit earlier. So thanks to all. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for attending the third Harvard Horizon Symposium, OHH3, as Professor Stephen Blyce put it last year in his closing remarks. Speaking of three, I heard people say there are three reasons to be a professor, June, July, and August. <laughs> For me, the three reasons are undergraduate students, graduate students, and the faculty colleagues. I put the graduate students in the middle, not merely because they are generations, but more importantly because they form a central pillar to support our intergenerational research and education enterprise. The Harvard Horizon program is designed to feature our PhD students' very best research accomplishments. In their roles as a research assistant to their faculty advisors or as a part of their own thesis research. At the same time, Harvard Horizons also demonstrate not only the great communication skills are important, but these skills can be acquired and perfected just like research skills. We all know well that a good communication skills are essential for success in becoming an effective teaching fellow or resident, resident tutor for undergraduate students. These skills also greatly benefit, of, benefit our graduate students regardless of their career paths, they, regardless of the career paths they choose. The Harvard Horizon program is therefore another example of the T-shaped education, which emphasize both the deep scholarly training, the vertical stroke of the T, and the broad professional development, the, hori the horizontal stroke of the T. The Harvard Horizon program is, essential, is especially effective in reinforcing these dual goals because as many of us have experienced, the shorter the talk, the deeper the understanding required to deliver it most effectively. Harvard Horizon scholars, as well as their advisors, have repeatedly told us that not only has Horizon training improved their presentational skills, but more importantly, it has helped to enrich their research. Indeed, the research you are about to hear of is rich and exciting. As an example of how exciting it is, you may have noticed in your program that although we have selected eight scholars, there's only seven scholars listed as presenters. Now, this is not a typo. This turned out to be a result of perhaps too much excitement over one scholar's research. Last week, a team of lawyers and others decided that it is a bit too risky to present this particular research publicly at this point. I will spare you the details because it is a complicated matter involving another institution, but suffice to say that any time you get lawyers involved, you know you are in a serious business or oh, trouble. <laughs> there are, of course, many people to thank for putting together a program such as this one. Since I should also obey the five minutes rule and limit my words, let me save most of my thanks for my concluding remarks. But I do want to mention now that starting from this year, we have a group of Harvard Horizons faculty fellows who are listed in the program, who not only selected the scholars, but also served as mentors to the eight Harvard Horizon scholars. I'm particularly grateful that the provost, Alan Garber, served as a faculty fellow despite his impossible schedule. It therefore gives me great pleasure to invite Alan to give the opening remarks representing both the university and the Harvard Horizon faculty fellows. Let's welcome Pro Provost Garber. Let me just add a quick welcome to that of Dean Mung. Uh, I'm very tempted to echo what Dean Mung has just said about the importance of the Harvard Horizons program. I, I have a very personal perspective on this, having received my PhD from GSAS, uh, well, more than a few years ago. But one of the things that I see over and over again in my role as provost is the importance of communicating the work that we do to a much wider audience than our colleagues. And our graduate students are well aware of the challenges, as Jali had mentioned, of 
being an effective uh, teacher in the classroom, uh, the challenges of presenting a seminar, more effectively presenting your new ideas in ways that will convince your colleagues. But we in academia have a much broader communications challenge. Today, we can no longer assume that a lot of deference will be granted to our authority on the basis of what we have studied and how well we have studied. We need to ensure that a broad public understands the significance of the work that we do. The decision to, uh, to create Harvard Horizons was brilliant in many ways, but what I view as most important is that it's focused on the core of our future in the academy, our PhD students. It is our PhD students who more than in any other part of the university will be teaching and conducting the research that will uh, benefit future generations. And it's a part of our work that is not that widely understood. So the opportunity to celebrate the brilliant work of our students and to make it comprehensible to non-specialists is a unique one and an important one. And I want to acknowledge the people who have made this possible. The original idea came from Professor Hisa Kuriyama. Uh, Dean Shali Meng championed it and uh, brought it to reality. It had the strong support of Dean Michael Smith and the, uh, the support of Professor Stephen Blythe. Without them, this program would never have come into being. And I also want to acknowledge the past Harvard Horizons scholars who have done such a tremendous job. And I also want to just say how eagerly I anticipate the presentations of the current Harvard Horizon scholars. I was very tempted to describe what you are about to witness as an intellectual feast, but you will be feasting only on appetizers, I'm afraid. And I hope they leave you hungry for much more. You will see the variety that our, of the work that our scholars conduct. You will have an idea of its importance, but alas, they will indeed be bite-sized pieces. So please join me in welcoming the Harvard Horizon Scholars for 2015, who will be introduced by Professor Kuriyama. President Faust is traveling and sent his regrets, her regrets that she couldn't attend this year's symposium. She asked that I read, read you this message. The contributions of graduate students who engage every day in, in the work of developing ideas, de deepening understanding, and advancing discovery are central to the continued success of Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. They represent the future of the knowledge and indeed the future of universities. That the future depends more that that the future depends on more than the unique contribution of individuals. The boundaries between fields are becoming more and more porous. Communicating about one's work outside one's discipline and embracing opportunities to collaborate are essential skills for scholars in the 21st century. This year's Harvard Horizon uh, scholars have mastered the art of presenting their work. They are persuasive and powerful. They communicate ideas that push the boundaries of what is known, ideas that connect disciplines and the fields. And they convey new insights new technologies, and new ways of thinking with approaches that are energizing and thought-provoking. I hope you enjoy the program. This is now the time for me to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Hisa Kuruyama. As you all have heard, that this program is his brainchild. But you may or may not know that initially when Hisa proposed the five-minute format, everyone else, myself included, thought that was simply impossible. Surely one would need five minutes just to give the background, then perhaps another five minutes to tell you what they have done. But Hisa insisted that five minutes would be enough. Hisa was, of course, absolutely correct, as previous uh, symposium have demonstrated, as you will see from today's symposium. Hisa is actually on sabbatical this year in Germany, so I'm particularly grateful that he flew back just to serve as the moderate of the scholar's presentation. Let's welcome and thank Professor Kuriyama.
So I'd like to welcome the, uh, the scholars on stage. If you... um, last week, I had a revelation. I received a package in the mail from a colleague on sabbatical, and it occurred to me that this gift perfectly captured the essence of Harvard Horizons presentations. Because Harvard Horizons presentations, after all, are containers that come from remote areas, often unfamiliar lands, territories of research. But at the same time, they make accessible and bring into our hands the fruits of these remote fields of research. But then it occurred to me that actually the real essence of Harvard Horizon presence is actually more like the, in, the gift inside the containers. Because after all, what happens in these presentations is that you get uncertain about the difference between the container and the contained, the message and the presentation. So I'd like you all to join me in welcoming the uh, Horizon Scholars for 2015. I'll, ask each, I'll introduce each one individually. Elizabeth Newton, astronomy. Leonora, Leonora Biddleston, Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. <laughs> Celine LeBeouf, Philosophy. Bridget Alex, Anthropology and Human Evolutionary Biology. Widushe Ileperuma, Material Science and Mechanical Engineering. <laughs> Prachi Sangavi, Health Policy. <laughs> Shane Campbell Staten, Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. And you lay applied physics. <laughs> and without further ado, we'll turn the stage over to our first speaker, Elizabeth Newton. When I look up at the night sky from Cambridge, I can only see a few dozen stars. From the dark mountaintops where I use telescopes, I can see thousands. Yet even this is a small fraction of all that's out there. Our Milky Way galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars. And 70% of all of these stars are a type of star we call red dwarfs. But even from those dark mountaintops, you won't see a single red dwarf. Even the closest and brightest is too faint to be seen without the aid of a telescope. After five years of researching and learning and teaching about the stars in our galaxy, I sometimes imagine that I can see some of our galaxy's small red stars.
What excites me the most about these stars are the planets we are finding around them. We are on a quest to find a planet like Earth, a planet similar in size and with the right temperature for liquid water, a planet with the potential for life as we know it. But finding a planet like Earth is difficult, and learning about what it's made of or what's in its atmosphere is even harder. With the methods we use to make these measurements, it is easier to find and to study planets around smaller stars. And the smallest stars in the universe are our red dwarfs. These stars are about a quarter the size of the sun, but hundreds of times fainter. Instead of emitting most of their light at optical colors like the sun, they emit most of their light in the infrared, where our detector technology has not been as advanced. Moreover, our theoretical models don't yet explain their fundamental stellar properties, such as size, age, or spin. As a result, these are one of the least well-studied type of star, and we don't yet have a good understanding of their physics. I'm intrigued by the mysteries these stars hold, but these uncertainties pose a fundamental problem for learning about the planets around them. The reason is that we measure the properties of the planet only relative to the properties of the star. So if, for example, we have any uncertainties about the star's size, we're similarly uncertain about the planet's size. Without knowledge of the basic physical properties of red dwarf stars, how can we hope to understand the planets that orbit them? It's to address this issue that I turned my attention to this type of star. Due to the uncertainties in our theoretical models, I take an observational approach to studying these stars. I used Harvard's Magellan Telescope in Chile and NASA's Infrared Telescope facility in Hawaii, employing a technique called spectroscopy. For each star, the final result is a spectrum like this one which shows the brightness of the star at different colors or wavelengths of light. I measured spectra for 600 of the most nearby red dwarf stars, obtaining thousands of individual observations. Each of these spectra contains clues to the star's properties. Atoms and molecules within the stars absorb light at specific colors, creating distinct spectral signatures. In this red dwarf spectrum, the deep troughs are due to absorption by atoms of aluminum and magnesium. I measure the depths of these dips because the strength of these features depend on the star's properties. I looked for patterns in the spectra, correlating the depths of features like these against different stellar properties. After carefully considering the many possibilities, I found new relationships between the depths of specific features and the star's temperatures, diameters, and chemical compositions. I calibrated these relationships using the small sample of stars whose properties we can directly measure. And then I took my calibrations and applied them to the stars that I had surveyed. Even though these are some of the most nearby stars to us, for many of them, it was the first time we learned about their properties with accuracy. I also took my calibrations and applied them to stars already known to have planets around them. One example is Kepler 372, a red dwarf star with three planets. Using my technique, I showed that the star is actually 15% bigger than we had previously thought. And because we measure the properties of the planets only relative to the properties of the star, this means that the planets are 15% bigger too. This change in size can be the difference between a rocky, Earth-like planet and one with significantly more gas, like Uranus or Neptune. We live in an era where it is possible to point to a star at night and say, this star has a planet around it. But it is around the red dwarf stars that can't be seen that we have the best prospects for finding and studying habitable, rocky worlds. It's the planets orbiting these stars whose atmospheres we will be able to study with the next generation of telescopes and on which we will first have the capability of finding signs of life. By learning more about our red dwarf neighbors, I hope to accelerate us towards a future where we can ask 
and answer new scientific questions about the Earth-like planets that orbit other stars. Thank you. In a rainforest, there are thousands of different species interacting with each other. A jaguar hunting a deer, trees competing for light, earthworms breaking down old leaves. This is an ecosystem defined as a community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. I want to understand the living world, which is made up of ecosystems. But how could we study the complexity of a living ecosystem like a rainforest in a rigorous way? To identify consistent patterns of species interactions, we would need to compare and contrast multiple separate rainforests. And we would need to compare rainforests where similar types of species interactions had evolved independently to see how natural selection influences these relationships. Of course, even just surveying all the organisms in one rainforest is an unimaginable feat. Instead, we need to find something that is small, manageable, and self-contained, yet that still represents an entire ecosystem. Studying pitcher plants can help with this problem. This is actually a leaf that has been modified through evolution to form a cup that holds water. And inside is a tiny ecosystem. I use these pictures as tools to look for universal ecosystem patterns. The pitcher produces nectar, which attracts insects, and they fall in and drown in the pool inside. Their digestive enzymes break them down and extract nutrients that are essential for the plant's growth. Now, these plants eat insects, but they also house specially adapted insects and a whole community of protozoa, bacteria, and fungi. There are predators, prey, and decomposers in this system, just as there are jaguar, deer, or earthworms in a rainforest. One of the qualities of pitcher plants that makes them ideal for looking for patterns is that they have evolved separately in different parts of the world. Three unrelated plant lineages have independently evolved these cup-shaped leaves that trap and digest insects. This is called convergent evolution. I studied two of the three types of pitcher plants one in Southeast Asia and the other in North America. I have collected hundreds of these tiny ecosystems from pitchers in different parts of the world. New DNA sequencing technologies allow me to identify all of the different organisms within each pitcher. I use Harvard's supercomputer to process millions of sequences, to analyze my data, and to quantify patterns. Months of analysis have led to results. I have found a strong pattern that seems to be driven by predator-prey interactions. Protozoa feed on bacteria, and in pitchers with more different types of bacterial prey, we see more different types of protozoan predators. Future studies will determine if this is a consistent pattern of multiple different ecosystems. But what other patterns can I find using a different approach? Here, each column represents the ecosystem inside a pitcher, and each color represents a different type of bacteria. This approach compares bacterial communities. I have found that the bacterial communities living in pitchers from Southeast Asia are more similar to the bacterial communities in pitchers from North America than they are to the bacterial communities in the soil directly surrounding them. I call this convergent interactions, which are interactions that are similar but have arisen independently. 
unrelated pitchers on opposite sides of the Earth have somehow selected for surprisingly similar bacterial communities. How might they be doing this? One way is through acidity. I have found that the acidity of the pitcher fluid influences which bacteria colonize the pitchers. This, uh, this can be applied to other areas. Because the, the plants can, to some extent, control properties such as acidity, they can curate the communities inside of them. The pitcher plant can be thought of as the plant's version of a human gut, which itself is a tiny ecosystem of interacting organisms. The microbes living in the pitcher help it to digest its food, just as our gut microbes help us. But I can grow these pitchers in the lab, and I can alter their properties, and I can see how altering these properties, such as acidity, changes what can grow inside of them. In this way, pitchers are model systems, and studying them can also inform how other hosts, such as humans, control our internal gut ecosystems. There are patterns to the organization of life. When you think of a rainforest or the multitudes of bacteria teeming in your gut, remember the pitcher plant as a tool for revealing patterns and connecting ecosystems, both outside and inside of ourselves. Thank you. In the wake of the Trayvon Martin verdict in 2013, President Obama spoke of his experience as a black man. He recounted times when he was followed when shopping in a department store, when he heard the locks on Carter's click as he crossed the street, when he was in an elevator with a woman clutching her purse nervously and holding her breath until she had a chance to get off. Philosophers like to ask, Big questions. Can we know anything? Is there a God? What is right or wrong? Likewise, philosophers thinking about race like to ask big questions. What is race? What is oppression? Should we strive for a colorblind society? Our philosophical thinking about race and social justice tends to focus on large-scale social change, on policies like affirmative action. Yet we rarely reflect on, on interactions like those described by President Obama. These are the very interactions that get in the way of large-scale social change. My approach is distinctive in that I focus on the micro level, on the level of day-to-day -day interactions. In my research, I pour over descriptions of personal experience, both from mainstream media and those already integrated in philosophical texts. Imagine that you're in circumstances like President Obama's. You feel the presence of the security personnel. You hear the locks click. You sense the woman clutching her purse. There's a high level of discomfort here, a physical reality to these experiences. I analyze these and similar experiences using the concept of bodily alienation. And here's what I have in mind. When we perform everyday tasks, we, our body's movements tend to recede from awareness. For example, when I'm biking, I don't need to focus on when to push each pedal. These movements have become second nature. However, under oppressive circumstances, we tend to internalize the gaze, the presence of others, and this can paralyze us. Now, a lot has been written about bodily alienation, about the structure of these breakdown cases. But comparatively little has been written about what we can do about situations like President Obama's. How can we change these types of situations? I adopted the concept of embodied resistance in order to make sense of our positive efforts. 
Embodied resistance has been used by sociologists and anthropologists to describe the activism of members of oppressed groups. However, in my research, I apply embodied resistance to activism of members of both oppressed and non-oppressed groups in order to emphasize the continuity between them. I regard embodied resistance as the result of our efforts to mutually understand each other, to negotiate internal resistances, and to connect with others. Let's return to the elevator scenario. Instead of putting yourself in President Obama's shoes, imagine now that you're the woman clutching your purse. How could you change the situation? Well, you might decide to smile or even touch the man, but this is likely to disturb him, to reinforce the sense of otherness members of oppressed groups already have. So how could you adopt a sensitive gesture? Well, here's where we can draw on a long, primarily Eastern philosophical tradition of thinking about the breath. Instead of reflexively clutching your purse or overriding your reflexes, you might breathe and relax and be able to respond in a more natural manner. You might smile or nod or even start a conversation. Think about how changes like these could snowball into larger ones. My point is this. We can perpetuate oppressive climates or we can contribute to ending them depending on how we use our bodies. My work consists in spelling out how we can use our bodies in positive ways. We're embodied beings and resisting oppression begins with the body. Thank you. Hello, everyone. All of you and every person living today are modern humans or homo sapiens. But for most of our evolution, we were not alone. There were different types of humans evolving in different regions, and the most famous are the Neanderthals in Europe. The situation changed around 50,000 years ago, when some modern humans came out of Africa, met other humans, interbred a little, and then all the other humans went extinct. So what happened? Why are we the only humans left? This is one of the biggest questions in human evolution. In order to answer it, we need to first figure out exactly where and when modern humans met other humans, like the Neanderthals. And this is the focus of my research. I am using radiocarbon dates to map Neanderthals and modern humans in time and space. The principles of radiocarbon dating are straightforward. Living organisms, including their bones, are mostly carbon, which comes in three forms differing by weight. The heaviest, radiocarbon, or carbon-14, is not stable, and when an organism dies, its radiocarbon transforms into nitrogen at a known rate. By measuring the amount of remaining radiocarbon, we can calculate back the number of years since an organism died. In this case, 30,000 years BP, or before present. We've had this method since the 1960s, and there are thousands of published dates relevant to the question of Neanderthal modern human interactions. The problem is, most of these dates are wrong. They are wrong because of issues of poor sample selection or contamination. You see, human fossils are incredibly rare, and we simply don't have enough of them to get a clear picture by dating fossils alone. What we do have a lot of is the trash these people left behind. Stone tools, animal bones, and other artifacts. Now, there are some distinctive tools that were made by modern humans. And there are some distinctive tools that were made by Neanderthals. And with care, we can use these to infer which group was present. Then we have to identify material that can be radiocarbon dated, stuff that was once alive, like charcoal and animal bones. And we need to be sure that these charcoal and animal bones were left by the same group that made the tools. So for animal bones, we look for signs of butchery to know that they were brought to the site by humans rather than carnivores. Here you see a microscope image of a bone with a cut mark on it and a piece of stone tool stuck in that cut mark. 
Or for charcoal, we take pieces from clear fireplaces made by humans. Many of the bad dates are because this kind of thoughtful sample selection was not followed. Researchers dated bones brought by hyenas or charcoal from natural fires, and these dates blurred our understanding of human history. By choosing samples with clear links to particular tools made by particular humans, we can address this first issue of poor sample selection. But now we have to worry about contamination. Any modern carbon that gets into a bone can alter the date by thousands of years. So we use recently developed chemical procedures to check for and remove contaminants. By applying these procedures to well-chosen samples, we can produce reliable dates. Many researchers are working on this, and here are their results. These are the sites with reliable dates. You'll notice most of them are in Western Europe, and maybe this is because archaeologists like to work where the wine is best. <laughs> but the problem is Neanderthals were spread all the way to Central Asia. My research fills in this map in three important regions, Northeast Europe, the Balkans, and the Levant. For each region, I reviewed hundreds of published dates to eliminate the bad dates that might have issues of poor sample selection or contamination. Then I went on excavations to dig up new material that I radiocarbon dated. You know how when most graduate students are working on their dissertation, it seems like they disappear into a hole in the ground? <laughs> well, this was me for many months every summer. <laughs> so in the end, I produced timelines and maps for each region that show where, when, and how Neanderthals and moderns overlapped. And here is my timeline for the Balkans, which is the most exciting. Time is on the y-axis from 55 to 20,000 years ago. Each column is an archaeology site. Purple is when Neanderthals were there, and red is when modern humans were there. At some sites where preservation allows, there is a layer of volcanic ash shown here in black. This ash is from a volcanic eruption that occurred 39,000 years ago in southern Italy. You'll notice most Neanderthals and some modern humans disappear at the same time. This eruption may have reduced populations of all types of humans and cleared the way for later groups to move in. Even so, we still have 5,000 years of overlap between Neanderthals shown in purple and these modern humans in red. 5,000 years is, in fact, an incredible span. It's the difference between ancient Mesopotamia and today. So how are these groups interacting for 5,000 years? I got a sense of the answer when I plotted the data on a map. Here you see purple dots when Neanderthals are at a site, and as time passes, red dots will appear when modern humans get there. Starting at 50,000, Neanderthals are widespread in the region. Then we see modern humans replace them along the northern river valleys and southern coast, and the last Neanderthals are in the central mountains of present-day Serbia and Croatia. And eventually, we only have modern humans left. So, although we know from genetic evidence that Neanderthals and modern humans can and did sometimes interbreed, in the case of the Balkans, they mostly avoided each other in distinct geographic zones. Which brings us back to our original question. Why did we survive and they go extinct? We still don't know the answer. But these results give us one time and place to look for the answer. During this period of overlap, how did we differ from Neanderthals? Did we possess some inherent superiority, or did fortuitous external factors like a volcanic eruption lead to our success? I think someday we will be able to answer these questions by taking a closer look at contexts like the Balkans, where Neanderthals and modern humans met. And whatever the answer, it is part of the shared history of everyone in this room and everyone living today. Thank you. You may recognize this building. It's the Engineering and Applied Sciences building just behind the Science Center. As an engineer, when I look at this photo, I see two types of materials. All the engineering structures are made with hard materials, such as metals, glass, concrete. But if you look at nature, plants and animals, including humans, are mostly made with soft materials. 
If we look inside animals or plants, we can find many soft biological materials that contain mostly water. Is there any engineering material that is similar to these biological materials? They are called hydrogels. Hydrogels are composed of water and a polymer network. Hydrogels are not new to us. One example is jello. <laughs> jello is soft, similar to natural biological materials. But the problem is that if you're thinking about engineering applications, many hydrogels, including jello, are not suitable. <laughs> They're so fragile, even a spoon can break them. They're not strong or tough enough to bear any load. Researchers have been trying to make strong and tough hydrogels for many years. But in our group, we were able to solve this problem. We developed a hydrogel that is dramatically different. It's much stronger and tougher than any of the hydrogels. It can be made into very thin sheets. It is extremely stretchable and hard to break. Our design principle includes adding two fragile hydrogels to improve the mechanical properties. If you look at the molecular structure, it contains single polymer networks. But by combining these two, we created a hybrid hydrogel that we call tough hydrogel. Tough hydrogels looks similar to its parent materials, but it's much stronger and tougher. They're easy to make, and they're also inexpensive. The synthesis of the hydrogel include adding the powders of the parent materials to a large quantity of water. They're then mixed with the cross-linking agents and poured it into a mold to set. When it is set, we can remove it in solid form. These hydrogels contain more than 90% water. They also can be made into very large pieces. As we develop this extremely tough hydrogel that is easy to make and inexpensive, I ask, what can we do with this material? Let's look at the molecular structure of these hydrogels. Hydrogels are primarily composed of water molecules. And the polymer network just gives the structural support. What we have done is that we have made water tough. Water has amazing properties. For example, water can absorb a large amount of heat. Water can conduct ions. And hydrogels retain all these properties. Let's consider the ability of absorbing heat from a fire. Our hypothesis was that when the hydrogel is exposed to a fire, Instead of catching fire, it can absorb a huge amount of heat and retard the fire. This is a comparison of firefighters fabric versus our hydrogels. As you can see, it's a huge problem in firefighting that current fire retarding fabrics do not give enough protection at hot flames. In contrast, our materials have a great potential to make apparel to protect people's lives from burn injuries. In case of a fire, this can be made into a big blanket that you can wrap around, or even a jacket that you can wear and escape safely. Because this hydrogel contain more than 90% water, it can be made very inexpensive, so anyone can have it. So in future, I envision that the technology with soft materials is so developed not only can they be used in fire protection, but we can think of many other applications. Because tough hydrogels are similar to natural tissues, one day it can be used for cartilage replacement. These hydrogels can be used as artificial muscles. Tough hydrogels can be made into variable electronics that are compatible with human body we can think of many other applications with this amazing material and possibly help to solve the long-standing engineering problems in new ways. Thank you.
A man collapses near you. You witness a car crash. Your friend experiences chest pain. What do you do in each of these situations? Most of us would call 911 and we would be relieved if an ambulance got to us quickly. Response time is also what our local governments and the media like to discuss. But what about everything after the ambulance gets there? Shouldn't we worry about that too? It turns out we've been thinking about that part much less. And as a result, our current ambulance system is based on little scientific evidence. In the United States, we have two types of ambulances. One type provides basic life support, and the other provides advanced life support. Suppose we have parallel worlds, one in which a cardiac arrest patient gets basic life support, the other in which she gets advanced life support. When the basic life support ambulance gets to the scene, it can provide chest compressions, use an automated defibrillator, and apply a bag valve mass for airway support. Because these are relatively simple measures, the basic ambulance can get to the hospital quickly. When the advanced ambulance gets to the scene, it can provide chest compressions too, but it would use a semi-automated defibrillator, endotracheal intubation for airway support, and it can set up an intravenous line for providing drugs and fluids. Because these interventions are relatively complex, the advanced ambulance takes longer to get to the hospital. In a carefully monitored study for cardiac arrest, advanced ambulances took about 28 minutes between the scene and the hospital. The basic ambulances took only 14 minutes. So the question is, which is better, getting only basic care but getting to the hospital quickly, or getting advanced care but getting to the hospital later? This question has been the focus of my research for the past few years. I started my work by putting together a large amount of data on Medicare patients. This included information on the patient's transports, their medical histories, and their demographics. I also had information on where patients lived and the hospitals they could attend. In all, I had access to 7.9 million randomly sampled ambulance transports that took place between 2006 and 2011. Once I had my data, I wanted to compare the outcomes of patients that received basic life support with the ones that received advanced life support. In one of my analyses, I used variation in the use of advanced life support across counties in the United States. The basic idea was this. Suppose I have two counties, County X and County Y. You can see that County Y has more advanced ambulances than County X. County Y also has more people dead after their ambulance transport than County X. If we compare the differences between counties X and Y in their use of advanced life support and outcomes, we can answer questions such as, how does ambulance type affect survival? I conducted a more complex version of this analysis using an econometrics approach called instrumental variables analysis. I also conducted a second study in which I used a statistics approach called propensity score weighting. Here, I compared similar groups of basic and advanced life support patients within counties. What I found suggests our ambulance system is in serious trouble. For example, if we look at major trauma cases with the most critical injuries, then out of 100 patients that get advanced life support, 63 would live to at least 90 days. But the other 37 would die before 90 days. However, if all of these patients instead got basic life support, then I estimate an additional 15 people would live to at least 90 days. That's based on my propensity score weighting analysis. Patients who got basic life support also did better after cardiac arrest, stroke, and heart attacks. So the summary is that basic life support has better outcomes than advanced life support. This is a big problem. 
Because currently, if we call 911, most of the time, we get the advanced ambulance. So how is it that advanced is worse than basic? Well, it seems the time to hospital matters. There are interventions such as endotracheal intubation, which may have serious delivery quality problems. And there are other interventions, such as aggressive fluid resuscitation in trauma patients that perhaps should wait until the patient's at the hospital. So advanced isn't really advanced when it comes to outcomes. So how did all these advanced ambulances even get out there? I'm still trying to understand the incentive structures and the history of our ambulance system. But what I do know is these decisions were not based on scientific evidence. In fact, what we know works is part of basic life support. So we have a lot of work ahead of us to fix our ambulance system. By using data and statistics, we carefully using data and statistics, <laughs> we can study causality in real world settings that are otherwise difficult to replicate in experiments. Powered with data, our generation can challenge the political and institutional inertia that supports practices in the absence of scientific evidence. Thank you. Our climate is changing <clears throat> and at an unprecedented rate. Extreme weather events are occurring more often and with greater intensity. As evolutionary biologists, we're trying to understand how these changes in climate will affect the biological processes that are important for the survival of life on our planet. Here in mid-latitudes, we've experienced an increase in winter storms. Part of the reason for this increase has been due to fluctuations in the polar vortex. Now, the polar vortex is a constant pattern of Arctic air spiraling around our poles, but as the planet warms, this pattern becomes more wavy and sends that Arctic air farther south. And as a result, there are uh, periodic, uh, uncommonly cold winter events at mid-latitudes like this event that occurred in January of 2014. I remember reading about the impacts that this particular storm had on the US, especially in the southeast, where uh, winters are typically pretty mild. And as I was reading, I came across an interesting image. It's a single lizard dead in the snow. Now, this is an intriguing image for me because this is the species that I've been studying for the past six years. This is the green anole. Anolis carolinensis. So let me take a step back and explain that I'm a herpetologist. I study reptiles and amphibians. Now, as cold-blooded animals are ectotherms, they lack the ability to produce their own internal source of body heat. And because of this, it makes them a good system for understanding the relationship between uh, variation in the thermal environment and aspects of form, function, and survival. I use phylogenetic techniques to trace the evolutionary history of species and climate modeling to understand how the environment has shifted uh, across that evolutionary history. I then use experimental physiology to test the limits of organismal performance in the face of this varying thermal regime. For the green anole, I've traced its evolutionary history to the island of Cuba, which is relatively warm and thermally stable environment all year round. But during the Pliocene, a few million years ago, there was a migration event to peninsular Florida and a subsequent range expansion into the vast majority of the southeastern US. Now, as a result of this northern migration, animals were selected in these environments that were better able to function in the face of colder winter times as they moved to higher latitudes resulting in this significant relationship between the cold tolerance of a population and the extreme cold experienced during the wintertime. But what happens 
So this is a, a pattern of local adaptation shaped by natural selection over the course of millions of years. But what happens when climate shifts on a much shorter time frame? I was able to get at this question using this polar vortex. So in order to understand this, I went to a single site. I started at a single site in Brownsville, Texas, right near the border of Mexico. Now, typical winter times at this site are relatively mild, and lizards at this site very rarely experience temperatures below their thermal limit. But as a result of the polar vortex, there was a shift in the thermal profile of the winter, and animals experienced almost twice as many days where they encountered temperatures below their thermal limit. So here's what cold tolerance looked like um, before the storm hit. But after the storm, in the spring, uh, I went back to this site and showed that the survivors of this storm were able to maintain function at significantly colder temperatures than the population was before. I then went back in the summer after temperatures had returned to normal and after, there's a next gen after there had been a next generation born at this site. Now, this next generation had never themselves experienced the polar vortex, but inherited, uh, inherited uh, traits of their parents. And I found that still, animals were able to maintain function at significantly lower temperatures. This is a signature of rapid evolutionary response to a single extreme climatic event within the turnover of a single generation. Now, it's possible that this shift happened just by chance. So I collected more data from four more sites moving northward up into Oklahoma. And as you move northward, Animals are naturally more cold tolerant and were less affected by this storm. And I was able to show that only in the southern part of this transect, where animals were not very cold tolerant and hit hardest by this storm, do we see this significant shift. So why is this important? When Charles Darwin originally proposed this idea of evolution by natural selection, he proposed it as a gradual process, one whose results could only be seen over many, many generations. But now, with data like this, we know that given the right circumstances, we can catch natural selection in the act and measure evolutionary response in real time. By gathering more of these types of data, we can have a better understanding of how life on this planet will respond to the extreme climatic events that are expected in the coming decades. Thank you. Now it is, can you hear me? Now it is a time to give our scholars presentation a scientific evaluation. Please applaud n times where n is the score you want to give to them on a scale of 0 to 100, 100 as being perfect. Please stand. Let's applaud. All right, that's more than 100. So. In my opening remarks, I mentioned that there are many people to thank. One of them is my dear friend, classmate, and a colleague, Stephen Blyce, who is both a professor of statistics and the president and the CEO of the Harvard Management Company. Stephen's generous donation to establish the Dean's Innovation Fund makes Harvard Horizon possible financially, from supporting the training of the scholars to the reception you're about to enjoy. Most importantly, however, Stephen himself exemplifies the critical importance of effective communication skills as a leader, both in the financial world and in the classroom, having won the prestigious Phi Beta Kappa Teaching Prize in 2013 and having been named the favorite professor of the class of 2011. Stephen has also made many other contributions to Harvard, including a research, research prize for graduate students in statistics. As a matter of fact, 
He has just arrived here after giving remarks at the research prize ceremony there. I therefore want to take this opportunity to thank him again for his many contributions to Harvard, both pedagogically and financially, with the hope that he will double the contribution to Harvard Horizon program in future years because now the Harvard Horizon program may need to retain a lawyer. <laughs> Stephen won't understand that joke because you missed the first part. I would explain to you privately what that means. <laughs> but joking aside, let's welcome Stephen to kick off the closing ceremony. Well, thank you, Jali. Thank you all so much for coming uh, this afternoon. I'm delighted to be part of the third Harvard Horizons, or HH3, as I like to, I like to call it, and uh, to be part of uh, this event, which showcases both the graduate school as a whole and the talent of its PhD students uh, that you've seen, seen today. As um, as Lee mentioned, we were PhD students together in the stats department in GSES back in the early 1990s. We were actually co-authors on a paper together, published in the Journal of the American Statistical Association. Um, and I think it's a, uh, an accurate reflection of the, our respective academic careers that that paper remains my most cited paper and is Zhaoli's 29th most cited paper. <laughs> you can Google Scholar him, it's, it's true. You can't Google Scholar me because I took myself off public view because it was too embarrassing. <laughs> but anyway, this year, this year I fight back because I'm happy to say that my recently published book, An Introduction to Quantitative Finance, which is based on my course that I've taught here at Harvard, outranks Zhao Li's recently published book, strengthening numbers <laughs> on Amazon by 1,546,636 places. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> it's smaller, it's cheaper, but it's better. So, um, so since, we, uh, since we graduated, Zhao Li and I have trod rather different paths, but we came back together as colleagues here uh, at Harvard in 2006, and since we were reunited, we, we talked a lot about communication, in particular the importance of uh, graduate students having the ability to convey complex and subtle ideas in a compelling, clear, coherent, convincing, alliterative way. And um, that's why I'm so delighted that we managed to get Harvard Horizons up and running uh, two years ago, and this now we're now in our, in our third year. Uh, communication is obviously incredibly important uh, within academia, but is also equally important uh, outside the academy. Um, firms hire PhD students from Harvard into biotech, IT, policy, healthcare, finance, um, in order to develop creative and innovative ideas. They don't want to hire PhDs uh, to dumb down and to lower their ambitions. However, they do need PhDs who can convey the subtlety and impact of their work to their colleagues, teammates, bosses, investors, etc. And in my own career on finance, in finance, I've seen many very smart PhD graduates from Harvard and elsewhere flounder, sunk really only by their, their inability to communicate. In fact, on Wall Street, it's sort of a truism that the failure rate for PhDs is much higher than the failure rate for undergraduates simply because of the communication mismatch. So the ability to communicate is so very important. And I think you've seen seven great examples of that uh, this afternoon. So congratulations again to the the Harvard scholars, you join a eminent group now of uh, 24 uh, Harvard Horizon scholars. Uh, I want to thank you all again for, for coming this afternoon. I hope um, to see 
many, if not all of you, here next year for Harvard Horizons 4, or HH4, or as we like to say in the stat department, HH all squared. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Although um, Stephen is too modest to mention that the difference in the rank is exactly the dollar amount he's going to contribute. It's a 1 million 600 <laughs> next year. So uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, the next person I want to thank is my boss, Mike Smith, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and the Sciences. Now, common wisdom suggests that thanking one's boss really requires a reason. But I do so because of his strong support for the Horizon program since its inception. I'm therefore particularly pleased that Dean Smith is here to give his reflection on the Harvard Horizon program and to present the, the Horizon certificates to all the scholars. Let's welcome Dean Smith. Thank you, Shally, and my welcome to everyone and congratulations to our scholars here today. What a fantastic event. Uh, obviously, I want to thank Professor Blythe for the incredible support he's given this hugely impactful program over the years. Professor Kuriyama, I don't know if you ever imagined that this would become such an event with such wonderful people in it, but thank you for that. Of course, Dean Mung your enthusiasm for this, and especially enthusiasm for our graduates and their professional development knows no bounds. So thank you very much for that. As you heard, I'm here to give some reflections on the talks. Uh, I don't get to see them beforehand, so I was busy scribbling down my thoughts here. So to the scholars, thank you so very much for all you've done. It was a delight to hear the range of topics that we heard from Elizabeth talking about worlds so far away from us through Lenora, the worlds within the teeniest little plants that we have today. That was fantastic and inspiring. I was also heartened to hear through Celine your talk about the small little gestures that we can make that not only can cause so much hurt but also can be a solution to it in the future. I wish you the best of luck. I would love to hear more as you develop that even further. I hope it has a huge impact on everything that happens in the world today. And then finally, Shane, maybe we should talk sometime. I, I couldn't help but in listening to the things that you were talking about around evolution to think about the time that we're experiencing right now. It's certainly a time of evolution and adaptation by many in our own community students turning into graduates, graduate students coming here and postdocs coming here and getting faculty positions, and even some faculty being turned into deans. We have one here with us today. Now there's a group that you might want to study at some time. <laughs> a little bit of under pressure, how do they adapt, what do we look for for resilience? That would be very interesting. But in all seriousness, an amazing set of talks. As you've heard so eloquently from Stephen and Jali, the importance of communication in this world. I'll just add to it that being able to crisply get your ideas across, I really think of as the start. It sparks the imagination of individuals who then can come together to do the kinds of amazing things that we've not only heard today, but we see across our entire campus. This is an incredibly impactful program. I look forward to its expansion in the future years, assuming we can get that to happen, right? Um, and uh, welcome to the new group of Harvard Horizon Scholars. And it's now our time to present them with certificates or something like that. I'm not sure, so I invite up. He sent Jali to help me with that part. To the group ship now. Oops. Too excited. Let's see. All the. So now we have the uh, the ceremony for the awarding of the certificates for this year, scholars. Um, 
The first is Elizabeth Newton. Leonora Biddleston. Celine LaBeouf. Bridget Alex. Widushe Ileperuma. Prachi Sangavi. Shane Campbell Stetton. And you lay. So I'd like to invite a student representative to speak a few, a few words about their experience as training for the Horizons program. You lay. standing right here on this stage. I cannot resist talking about my research and my passions. <laughs> but today, a stronger propensity leads me to share with you about my Harvard Horizons experience. Deeply aware of the importance of communication skill in academic sen setting, I realized it is really important to learn all those skills with a group of fantastic people. After four months of training, I'm surprised to see myself going through a series of phenomenal improvements, which are completely inseparable from the media experts, the back center specialists, and even faculty mentors. Certainly, this skill does not only apply right here and right now. In fact, it has already become part of me. And I believe it will transcend myself as a scholar to reach unlimited possibility throughout my future careers. Again, I just want to say thank you so much, Harvard Horizon, for this wonderful and priceless experience. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here to be with us today. This has been a really amazing two months, and I didn't realize quite how proud I'd be until we were all standing up on this stage together. For most of us, the first day we met was at the beginning of this program. Now I find myself muttering lines from your speeches throughout my day. <laughs> We'd like to thank, uh, and very enthusiastically, the organizers of Harvard Horizons, uh, some of whom are up here on the stage with us right now. So Dean Shaoli Mung, Dean Margot Gill, Dean Michael Smith, Provost Alan Garber, uh, Professor Stephen Blythe, and Professor Shigehisa Kurayama. We are so grateful to have had this chance, this privilege, to be up here and to share our research with all of you. While the chance to showcase our work has been rewarding, research is not done in a vacuum. Each of us has had the support of many of you here in the audience. At the core of our research communities are our thesis advisors and our research groups. Thank you for your advice and support over the many years that we've been here. For the two months of Harvard Horizons, we've also gotten help from many places. We have turned to you, our friends, our family members, and colleagues for advice. 
We made you stay up late with us while we tweaked our sides yet again. And we asked you difficult questions like, how can I summarize this year of research in a single sentence? And how can I make you care about this somewhat esoteric research topic? So I'm going to do something a little bit embarrassing now, but if you are in one of our labs or on our thesis advisory committees, or if you have supported us, mentored us, or listened to one of the many, many times we've practiced these short talks, uh, would you please stand up so we could give you a round of applause? I hope you saw how many people stood up in the audience around you. We are so lucky to be surrounded by such large and supportive communities. For us, as Horizon Scholars, many of the benefits have been immediate. The training has helped us prepare for other presentations of our research. For example, three of the scholars just defended their dissertations in the last week. Other effects may be subtler. We have made friends across our different departments, bonding while searching through buildings on the weekend trying to find empty rooms to practice in. The Horizons training has encouraged us to think both broadly and deeply about our work, and it has empowered us by improving our content and presentation skills. There are many people behind the scenes who have facilitated this program. First, I want to thank Lucia Zaitseva and Anne Hall for your media and communications help. And then four other people have met with us weekly for months and have dedicated a lot of time and energy to our presentations. Pamela Pollock has helped us to frame our research broadly and to present the content clearly. Sarah Jessup has taught us great tools to improve our speaking and movement. Marlon Kuzmik and Lindsay Lodi have assisted in making our presentations visually compelling. Would the four of you please come up to the stage to receive a small token of our thanks. Thank you all. As I mentioned earlier, there are many, many people to thank, and we have already here uh, quite a few thanks, uh, but I want to add mine. I particularly want to take this opportunity to thank the Box Center and the leadership of Professor Rob Lu for providing crucial training and media support, as you just have heard. In particular, I want to again thank uh, Pamela Pollock, the Associate Director for Professional and Scholarly Development, Marlin, uh, Marlin Kuzmik, Associate Director for Media, Literacy, and Visualization, and Sarah Jessup, uh, Associate Director for Speaking uh, in Instructions. And I also want to thank the uh, scholars themselves for many, many hard, you know, uh, days hard work, and thank uh, all the family members coming here to, to, to support them. And uh, uh, last but not least, the entire GSS team, led by Dean Margot Gill, for their tremendous support. Let's give all of them a round of applause. <laughs> so now let me close this year's symposium with the wish that you have learned as much as I have. From this point on, if I'm in a hurry, I would definitely order a basic ambulance <laughs> instead of an advanced one for my tra transport. And any time I need to be on diet, I'll be imagining the similarity between my gut and the pitcher plan. <laughs> but of course, there's absolutely no reason for anyone to be on diet tonight because there's a grand reception waiting for, for all of us in Santa Theater transept. So please join me, and thank you for coming, and see you at HH4. Thank you. Thank you.